Christmas is the incredible story of God becoming one of us. That's what Christians believe. God became one of us, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. God, the creator, the sustainer of the universe dwells outside of time, becoming like one of us. Why would he do that? Why would God enter into humanity from glory? The writer of the book of Hebrews, he, he poses this question this way. So in chapter 1 of Hebrews, he describes how Jesus is vastly superior to the angels. And that's kind of obvious because God the Son, Jesus, existed eternally. So he was not created, whereas angels were created and angels worship him. That's chapter 1. Jesus vastly superior to the angels. But then chapter 2 says something surprising. Hebrews 2 verse 9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. So follow this reasoning with me here for a second. With the birth of Jesus, we find now Jesus, who was vastly superior to angels. Angels serve him. Angels worship him. Angels bow before him. But in that little moment, that little while, those 30 years on earth, God the Son became lower than angels. I'm sure you would agree with me that is quite a demotion. Right? Why would God the Son do that? God became one of us. Why? Well, I'm glad you all asked, because I'm going to ask, answer that question this morning. Three reasons why. For a little while, he became lower than angels, became like us. So firstly, quite simply to say, God became one of us, because he really wants to be with us. God really wants to be with us. So one of the most memorable prophecies in the Old Testament of the coming of Christ is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And the prophecy says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. That's repeated word for word in Matthew 1 verse 23, but Matthew adds an explanation of what Emmanuel, that we've just sung about, what that means. It means God with us. In other words, the birth of Jesus, Christmas Day, is the culmination of God's desire his desire to be with us. Now, to be sure, God had been present with his people in various ways before the birth of Jesus. If you're reading through the Bible from the Old Testament, you will come across the phrase God with us over 118 times. So, For example, when God speaks to the great patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God says to them, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. As God speaks to Moses, who's now going to lead God's people out of slavery in Egypt, he says to Moses, I will be, don't you worry, I will be with you. To those same people now entering the promised land 40 odd years later, God says to Joshua, who's leading them, Joshua, don't be frightened, don't be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And then even in the poets and the prophets, Psalm 23 verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me, and therefore I fear no evil. But then there comes a slight change. So all these Old Testament passages of how in various ways God was with us, there's a change when Jesus comes, a slight change, a significant change. See if you can pick it up. John 1 verse 14 now says, 
And the word God became flesh and dwelled among us. What's the difference? See, God had been with his people in a variety of ways before Christmas, but now on Christmas Day, we celebrate God is at last with us as one of us. In person, as it were. That's a word that we never used before 2020, did we? I did not have that hyphenated word in my vocabulary before this year, in person. Hey, I'm having a party. Uh, what is it, in person or online? Like, what? Having a meeting. Is that a virtual meeting or is that an in-person meeting? We did not have this before this year. Christmas is God with us in person as one of us. What I'm trying to show you, what I'd love for you to see this morning, is God's supreme desire, his desire to be with us. Christmas tells us this at the very least. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot more to it, but at the very least describes the lengths God went to to be with us, literally moved heaven and earth, got rid of the metaphysical barrier between eternity and physical reality in order to be with us. How stunning is that? You see this video on Christmas, you come back to these old, old stories and remind ourselves of how shocking it is. God's desire to be with us. So Jesus, who's God with us as one of us, when, when he was about to leave earth, so he's praying for his disciples, he's about to go away, he prays that amazing prayer in John 17, and one of the things he prays for in verse, um, in verse 4 is he says this, sorry, verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. Let's just read that again. He's praying this for his disciples. Now, listen, he's not just talking about the 12 disciples. We know that because in verse 20, just a few verses before, he explicitly says, my prayer is not just for these, but for everyone who will come after them, who will believe in me because of what they said. That's us. When you read Jesus' prayer in John 17, read it for us. And he says, Father, I desire that they also may be with me where I am. Jesus desires to be with us. He wants us around. He wants you around. I mean, again, let's just think of how, how shocking that is. I mean, I don't know of any important or really powerful person who would really make it evident to me that he wants me around, right? So, for example, that would be like Sia Colisi, captain of the Springboks, phoning me up before the World Cup and going, hey, man, we're about to go on this, like, really difficult thing. We're super nervous. We'd, I've got booked your first-class ticket because, man, I just want you around, Right, that's, that's not going to happen. And by the way, for all of those watching online wondering how in word bingo I was ever going to bring spring bucks into a Christmas message, if you kind of days off there, you're going to check that off your list. Right, that would never happen. Here is Jesus, God, Son of God, eternal God, praying, it's my desire, I'm going, it's my desire that they would be with me. where I'm going. Don't miss this, this Christmas. Simple truth that God wants to be with us. In fact, earlier, before he prays for his disciples as he leaves, when he breaks the news, hey guys, it's been fun, but it's time for me to go. Understandably, when he told his disciples he's going to leave, there was a little bit of panic among them, and so he reassures them with those famous words uh, in John 14, verse 1 to 3. He says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't worry. 
believe in God, believe also in me, because in my Father's house are many rooms. If it wasn't so, would I be telling you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I'm going to come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Do you see this again? He's going, I'm about to prepare a place. I'm going, but don't worry. I'm preparing a place so that you can be where I am. Oh, and by the way, preparing a place for you involves I'm about to suffer and be crucified and die, take on your sins, experience the judgment against those sins that you should experience, but I'm going to do that for you so that you can be where I am. That's a little bit more than, hey, I'd really love for you to come to my house after this Christmas service. Give me 15 minutes while I go vacuum. It's like I really want you to be with where I am, but first, let me just go atone for your sins. Do you understand how much God wants to be with us? Not yet? Okay, I'm going to keep going. Those of you watching online, uh, it's not your fault. I can't hear you. I can't, like, see, it's these guys here. I need to be responding. So let me just carry on a little bit later in that same passage. Jesus now, again, talking to those who would believe in him and choose to follow him says in verse 23, John 14, if anybody loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. Listen to this. And we will come to him and make our home with him. And if you're rushing home to prepare your place for a visitor, you hear a knock at the door in this passage When you open that door, there's God the Father, there's God the Son with their sleeping bag going, where are you here to stay? Right, That's a verse we looked at like a few weeks ago, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. God wants to be with us. God wants to be with you. Yes, you. Little old you. Little old me, with all our brokenness, with all our weaknesses, with all our failures, in all of our rebellion, in all of our grumpiness, in all of our general not so nice to be aroundness, especially if you're a holy and righteous God in this, God wants to be with us. Isn't that amazing? The gospel, the good news is the promise that despite every reason we've given to him, every reason we've given to God to ignore us, stay away from us, abandon us, God has come to be with us forever. Because he wants to. So what does that tell you about how God feels about you? Because that's really what I want you to know. What does it tell you about how God feels about you? It should tell you that he loves you, that he has a great affection for you. Please don't miss that this Christmas day. Number two, God came to be with us not just because he wants to, because of his affection for us, but God came to be with us to help us. To help us. That's what all of those 118 Old Testament verses are about. They're meant to be an encouragement. If you're going through any sorts of trouble, when life gets tough, remember, I will be with you, God says, over and over again. Whatever battle you're walking into, God is not leaving you to yourself. He's not saying you're on your own now, good luck. What all of those verses are telling us is that in some way, God is saying, no, 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 I'm right here with you, fighting with you, fighting for you on your behalf. God is not just our friend. He is our 
ally, our allies here to help us. And Christmas Day is the supreme reminder of that. The lengths God went to, to tell us, I'm with you. I feel the need to remind everybody this year that God has not abandoned us. God has not abandoned you. Listen, you would be forgiven for thinking that in the year 2020. God has not abandoned us. I came across this verse just this week, just in, in my own reading, it jumped out at me, I think, because I was thinking of Christmas Day. It's another passage, an Old Testament passage that gets referenced in the New Testament. And whenever you're reading the New Testament and there's a reference to the Old, like this hyperlink, you go, oh, well, this is probably important. That's a verse that some of you might be quite uh, familiar with. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. You know that one? That's from Romans 10, 15. It's quoting Isaiah 52. So it's a hyperlink. We're like, whoa, hang on. This is important. And it's about the gospel, good news. We're like, okay, we're paying attention. And in Isaiah 52, verse 6, so it's, it's this proclamation. The good news is coming, guys. And if you've read Isaiah, you need to hear that. The good news is coming, and here is how it is framed. Verse 6 of Isaiah 52. I hope this is as meaningful to you as it was to me. For this reason, God says, my people will know my name. Good news is coming. My people will know my name. For this reason, they will know at that time that I am the God who says, here I am. They will know my name, my nature, my fundamental nature is I am a God who says, here I am. He is the God who is there. He's there. Even when it doesn't seem like it. It reminds me of my little my little two-year-old daughter, Emma Rose, the most exquisite little creature on this earth. She's just gone two, a couple of weeks ago. And she's kind of in that phase where we're around at home and I'm like kind of there and she's busy. And then I might go to like another room or like go outside and she'll be okay. But then like very quickly realize, oh, daddy's gone. And she'll go, daddy, 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 you know. And I'm like responding, I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm here. <laughs> you know, it's cute, like the first like four times, and then it's really annoying. But you know what? Like sometimes that's how it feels to us. It feels like God has left the room, that he's left the house. But what this verse is reminding us, no, 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 my name, my nature, I am the God who says, here I am. If you had to ask, where are you, you would hear God saying, here I am. He's the God who's around. Not just because he wants to be, to help us, to help us. This is Stunning. There is no other religion that gets to say this at all. It's a stupendous feature of Christianity that we worship a God who is at the same time above and over and removed and distant, but sovereign, controlling the affairs of the universe, but at the very same time, right here beside us. There is nothing like it in the whole world. A God who is both out there controlling the affairs of the world and humanity, but at the very same time right next to us. And we need, we need God, in, God in both those positions, don't we? A couple of, about a year ago or so, I was uh, at, my, at my parents' house with the kids, sometimes I go and work from home there. My mom looks after the kids while I do some work from the office over there. And uh, Benjamin, he was a bit younger, riding one of those you know, plastic motorbike things. And my parents got this long driveway that slopes downwards and there's a steel gate at the end and he's riding happily. 
And um, I'm busy working there. My brother's around. He lives in Cape Town, but he was, he was around for the day. And Benjamin had ridden down this path and many times, but had, for some reason, slammed into the gate at the end of the driveway. And there was a piece of metal sticking out the gate. And it, and it went to his head. And so I'm just busy working, and my brother just comes into the room and says, hey, bro, so you might want to come check this out. As I go outside, and I just see Benjamin coming crying, and his blood streaming all the way down his face. Now, this guy, I'm still kind of a young parent at this point. I don't think like this had happened before. So I'm just in full panic mode. So I just grab whatever I can. It's like a dish towel. I'm like holding it against his head. I'm like, we got to get to, we got to get to the hospital like now. You know, but I can't drive because I've got to hold this. It really was like, I think I could, think I could see his scale, right? You know? So I just, I just tell Gary, just, bro, just get in the car. You drive. Here's the keys. Just get us to casualty as soon as possible. I don't even want to know how fast you're driving or how you get us there. Just get us there. And so Gary jumps into the front seat and he drives the car. I'm in the back next to Benjamin and I'm holding this dish towel against his head. It's soaking up blood. And I'm just all the time going, it's okay, buddy. You're going to be okay. Everything's all right. Daddy's here. You're going to go to a doctor. And he's, Shh, it's okay, bud. In that scenario, I mean, I needed Gary in the front just taking care of business, just getting us there. And I needed to be at the back of Benjamin. That's God. That's God with us. At the same time, steering, driving, taking care of business, getting us where we need to go. We don't even know how. I don't even care. You just get us where we need to go. But it's God at the same time with us, right next to us, with his hands on our bloodied faces, reassuring us, hey, but it's going to be okay. You're going to be all right. I'm taking care of things. I'm getting you where you need to go. And everything is going to be okay. Listen, despite what this year has told you, God has not abandoned us. He's the God who's here. Lastly, on Christmas, we could not only confidently say that God is with us because he wants to be and to help us, but he's also a God who knows what we are going through. Not just a God who sympathizes with us. He knows. He has experienced every kind of hurt and pain that we go through as human beings. I mean, this is, this is just very obvious Christmas Day stuff because God became flesh, took on weak human flesh. We remember Christmas. God himself got tired, got hungry, got hangry, yeah, I remember that day, the fig tree, Jesus is hungry, there's no figs, and just destroys the fig tree. We read in the Bible of how he felt physically weak. He experienced abandonment, grief, loss, dwelled with, touched those who were sick. He experienced, I believe, what it feels like to be overwhelmed. That Garden of Gethsemane moment, that's how I see that. This is God, this is Jesus, overwhelmed at the point of grief. And experience then intense physical suffering, just so it happened to be the suffering and pain we should have experienced that he was experiencing on our behalf and eventually tasted death. God himself knows what it's like to suffer to have troubles as a human being. Again, this is another huge distinction between Christianity and any other religion in the world. Other religions, gods may claim to assist people, at best sympathize with their struggles, but not enter into their struggles. Gods don't do that. God's don't do that. 
in the ancient Greek poem, the Iliad by Homer, written years before Christ. He writes that no human being will escape trouble in this life. And he says this, for such is the way the gods spun life for unfortunate mortals that we live in happiness, but the gods themselves have no sorrows. That's not our God. That's not our experience of God. We have an experience. We worship a God who came not just to be like us, became one of us, suffered everything that we suffer. That should be of great encouragement to you. Simple fact, God identifies with us. Does that make you feel a little bit? It should. God identifies with us and what we're going through in every way. But here's the thing. What's even greater than just the encouragement that God identifies with us is the reality that that means we can identify with God. In other words, God does not have to be an unknowable, distant, far removed, vague reality. He identifies with us. It means we can identify with him and you can know him and in a very real way experience the reality of what it's like to have God with us. It's my prayer that you will experience that this Christmas day. So let's pray for that. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, the one who rules over the universe, who created it, who is sustaining it, who is bringing it to its perfect design completion the way you have designed it to go. Our God, the earthly Son, Jesus, the embodiment of God with us, and God, Holy Spirit, now in a very real way, mediating the presence of God right now with us. I pray, we pray, that this Christmas day we would know the reality of your affection for us, how you moved heaven and earth to be with us, your desire for us to be with you. May we be moved in the bottom of our hearts at the preparation, the lens it took, what it took for us to be with you, removing this obstacle of sin. May we experience your help. We need you. Help us. Help us. For the rest of this year and into next year. We thank you that you know us. You know our troubles. You've been through them. You're right with us and you can lead us through them because you've been through it and now reign victorious of every form of suffering and struggle. And so we get to reign with you over them too. Thank you, Jesus. May we know your presence through your Holy Spirit with us today and every day. Amen.